Welcome to the Neuroblastoma Parent Global Symposium. My name is Nicole from Zoe for Life, and I'll be moderating this session. The importance of aftercare and long-term follow-up, which is being delivered by Dr. Sogol Mustufi Moab, pediatric oncologist and endocrinologist from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Stephen Sands, Director of Pediatric Neuropsychology from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And Dr. Lisa Diller, the Director of the Childhood Cancer Survivor Program from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Before I hand over, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit questions during the session for the speaker to address at the end. If the button's not showing, just tap or hover your cursor to bring it up. If you see a question there that you like, give it a thumbs up to move it up the list. Over to you, Dr. Mostufi Moab. Thank you. Um, I will just need to share my screen right now. So good afternoon or good day, everyone. Um, greetings from City of Brotherly Love, also known as uh, Philadelphia. Um, thank you, Nicole, for those kind introduction, uh, introductory words. I am a combined endocrinologist and oncologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And what I actually focus on um, is endocrine late effects after childhood cancer therapy and have a particular interest and focus in neuroblastoma. So I see a lot of patients with high-risk high neuroblastoma. Um, I have been tasked to talk about endocrine late effects after neuroblastoma therapy for this session, which um, truthfully is a topic that in and of itself can take um, at least an hour in and of itself. And I uh, frequently spend a fair bit of time with each of the parents who uh, bring their children for second opinion. So what I will hopefully accomplish over the next 20 minutes or so is to really give you an overview and some insight into some of the important late effects um, that is important for any uh, parent of a survivor of uh, a child with high-risk neuroblastoma to be aware of. Um, and just to make sure um, prior to you know, moving on to this presentation that I really have no conflicts to disclose. What I wanted to start off with, and this is you know, truly, I think a seminal paper that Dr. Diller published, even though it's uh, 11 years now, but it really highlighted the presence of uh, chronic conditions and it's out, as outlined in the um, you know, yellow box here, endocrine late effects actually are a recognized uh, challenge in childhood uh, survivors of cancer and particularly when you compare these children uh, to their siblings. And I think actually a nicer way to summarize that is um, nine out of 10 child who actually successfully um, reaches cure from their childhood cancer will develop a chronic health condition. And I think that this is, to me, nine out of 10 is a far more telling statistics than just focusing on 90%. So I think that that really highlights the fact that cancer comes at a cost. And I think as an endocrinologist, the reason this is important is that hormonal disorders or endocrine disorders are actually the leading morbidity. So majority of children, particularly with respect to high-risk neuroblastoma, actually this uh, challenge with respect to the different hormonal or endocrine systems can be as high as 75%. So it's a, it's a definite uh, important issue and majority of parents who have a child who has survived high-risk neuroblastoma will need to at least at some point see an endocrinologist based on one of the childhood uh, related concerns that will manifest. And I think in this uh, slide here, what I wanna at least highlight is that when you take common endocrine conditions, so thyroid related problems, even thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer in adults, but at least even in pediatric patients um, who have never prior been diagnosed with cancer, we can certainly see thyroid cancer as well as diabetes mellitus. So these are common problems that at least endocrinologists will have to uh, see patients. And when you actually look at any childhood cancer survivor, which are the, the blue boxes compared to, um, you know, uh, the, or uh, sorry, the, you know, in the survivors overall, so which is the darker blue compared to, you know, survivors who either have had types of treatments like radiation or doses of, uh, and types of chemotherapy that can certainly put you at risk for um, different damage to the organ, uh, endocrine organ systems. These patients overall have significantly higher uh, challenges with respect to these common endocrine disorders, even when you compare them to siblings. 
But what's important to realize is that there is no such a thing as what, you know, some people erroneously like to think as low risk survivors, because I think any diagnosis of cancer and subsequent treatment certainly can put you at risk for developing um, chronic conditions or problems in the endocrine system. So what I hope to at least spend the rest of this presentation is to really highlight one of the biggest challenges after surviving high-risk neuroblastoma therapy, which is growth disorders. This is really a challenge and uh, overwhelming majority of pediatric patients after uh, surviving high-risk neuroblastoma therapy will likely have to see an endocrinologist with respect to lack of growth. Um, I do wanna talk about thyroid effects. I think that that's an important late effect for us to recognize. I will briefly touch base on puberty. I am not gonna go into gonadal function in detail because I know we have a presentation specifically focused on fertility. So I will address that more as an endocrinologist. And then lastly, I do wanna highlight, you know, diabetes mellitus, because I think that that's a recognizing late effect that is coming to attention, but we still have to learn more about it. But I wanna make sure that at least everyone is aware of some of these challenges. So as I alluded to earlier, growth is a really important challenge. So the growth chart that I actually am showing here is a common representation of many children that I have actually um, continued to care for at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And this is a young man who now has reached um, you know, the age of 18 and I have been seeing him for a while. And what is more notable here is that the dot that's on the top of the screen is his genetic potential. So this young man actually would have been destined to grow at the 90th percentile, but because of his challenge and uh, young diagnosis with high-risk neuroblastoma, he's continued to have a very abnormal growth pattern. And unfortunately, this has um, been an ongoing challenge that we have tried to address. So growth impairment is actually very frequent. Um, and more likely than not, majority of high-risk neuroblastoma survivors will not reach the genetic potential that they've had. So the short stature is a common finding, uh, particularly even as an adult. And this is not just a one cause that you can address uh, by after quickly identifying it. It's more of a couple of reasons that come together. So multiple contributing factors. Um, it's actually the disease process. So certainly high-risk neuroblastoma in and of itself is a big challenge. We do have to give um, a lot of intense systemic combined therapy that a lot of that can certainly have an impact on um, the toddlers and the younger patients who typically tend to have the diagnosis of high-risk neuroblastoma because of that intensity of treatment and the long duration of uh, sustained uh, nutritional intake for the prolonged period of time certainly can have its periods of challenge. So overall, poor nutritional intake can certainly compromise growth given that uh, nutrition is critical for uh, normal growth and development. And then there's also the effects of chemotherapy and spine radiation. So majority of high-risk neuroblastoma patients who have local radiation to the primary site, if it's within the adrenal gland, will have some of that effect of radiation on the spine. So the vertebral um, bodies in the spine will have radiation exposure, and that certainly can have an effect on the growth plates within the spine. And so some of the growth is going to be impeded because of the effect on spine growth. And more importantly, one of the areas that I will come to is cisretinoic acid or Retin-A, which we use in the treatment of high-risk neuroblastoma. And I think that that uh, nationally and internationally is a, a consistent uh, the treatment protocol that's used and that certainly can result in growth plate injury. And I, and I will share a few slides from studies that we have done here at the Children's Hospital. And then lastly, the other hormonal problems like an underactive thyroid, if, you, if the child goes into puberty on the early side because of you know, other you know, uh, areas, for example, if they had radiation to the brain at a very young age, sometimes that can cause you to go into puberty on the early side. And then more often than not, um, a lot of children may have problems actually going into uh, puberty. And that is one of the reasons that usually an endocrine doctor will likely need to see a survivor of high-risk neuroblastoma. And so the puberty hormones or sex hormones are actually very important from a growth perspective. So a lot of 15%, uh, for example, of your final height comes during that pubertal growth spurt. And so a lot of these multifactorial, also hormonal reasons compound the challenges from the cancer therapy itself. So as I mentioned, and I've mentioned several times, really there are significant challenges or it's overall the linear growth and the growth velocity of a lot of children um, after high-risk neuroblastoma continues to be impacted even when they um, are years after their treatment. 
Um, and a lot of this actually has to do with, um, you know, the radiation effects. Some patients actually are survivors of older regimens like total body radiation, and we'll talk about that, but sometimes actually getting uh, radiation to areas, for example, if you have skull metastases or if you have uh, neuroblastoma that has a threat to the vision based on, you know, met metastatic pattern where, you know, the patient actually needs to get emergent uh, radiation therapy and the effects of that radiation on the pituitary gland can in and of itself result in not making enough growth hormone on top of a lot of the other challenges that I mentioned in the previous slide. And what is important to know is that in high-risk neuroblastoma survivors who actually have problems with making growth hormone as a result of the radiation that they receive, those patients actually even have more of a challenge with short stature. So the short stature is really compounded even uh, when the doctors diagnose this uh, growth hormone deficiency promptly and actually treat it, but overall the final height is far more compromised in patients who have a diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. And a lot of that unfortunately has to do with the lack of appropriate response um, to growth hormone treatment, which um, likely is because of the effects of the cis retinoic acid on the growth plate. And I, hopefully I will show you some of the slides uh, to make it a little bit more um, you know, visual in terms of what I really mean by that. But just to give you a little bit of understanding, so your growth hormone is actually a hormone that's made in the pituitary gland. And anytime that there's radiation to the brain, it's the most common hormone that can get affected. And in children, this is important because it, it, there's uh, the young age of a child particularly makes them susceptible to developing growth hormone deficiency after radiation. And I think that this is an important concept that most endocrine doctors who particularly are used to taking care of children who've had a diagnosis of cancer and treatment are, are aware of, but occasionally this may not be something that's quickly recognized. So that's an, under, that's an important area to recognize that particularly patients um, who required cranial radiation um, for their neuroblastoma treatment, those patients are at unique high risk. And then that severity is really going to be uh, dependent on how high of a radiation dose that child needed to get. Um, but the other thing is to realize that if they didn't even have to give a high dose of radiation, the longer you're out from that radiation, the higher the risk is. So again, an 18 month old or a two year old who gets this radiation, there's still significant time that that child needs to grow. And I would really worry about that child's ability to make appropriate growth hormone when they're five, six, so again, several years from the time at which they got their radiation exposure. And again, really it's the young patients that are so sensitive. And that really is one of the hallmarks with high-risk neuroblastoma because majority of uh, patients are toddlers when they get diagnosed uh, with their disease. And so what I wanna do with this before I go into some of the data slides is to give you a little bit of understanding because when it comes to some outcomes like height, we always talk about uh, Z scores, which can be confusing because the numbers may not necessarily be intuitive and make sense. So on this slide here, I have a natural bell distribution curve and essentially that middle line there at zero really corresponds to the 50th percentile. So again, if someone has a Z-score of zero, they're at the 50th percentile. So Z-scores are a way for us to normalize um, you know, the, the actual findings that you have in your study based on you know, what you're measuring to what's the normative distribution. But it is important to realize, so for example, someone who has a high Z-score of negative two, that means on average, those individuals or those survivors you know, are uh, at the at two and a half percent, so that they're they have marked short stature compared to the normative uh, population. So I think that that you know is important to keep in mind to really understand the impact of this slide here. That was a study um, uh, conducted actually by a lot of the um, providers at the at, at Dana Farber. Dr. Diller is obviously um, on this uh, study as well, but Dr. Cohen is an endocrinologist and a dear colleague who's at uh, Boston Children. And really this slide is showing the um, children with high-risk neuroblastoma where their growth is followed over time and their final adult height. And so the pink line that I have here corresponds to a Z-score of zero. And so as you can see here, these individuals have high Z-scores um, that are really impacted. So these are, you know, again, if you remember, I said a Z-score of minus two, that means on average that person is at the two and a half 
percentile. So that's significant short stature, and this is even worse than that. So, uh, so a real problem with respect to abnormal growth and not necessarily improving that growth, particularly after uh, completing therapy. Now, I think as uh, parents who've had a child that has gone through high-risk neuroblastoma therapy, you certainly remember the challenge of giving uh, cisretinoic acid. It's certainly never a pleasant uh, experience to be able to get those capsules in. But what really, from a chemical standpoint, cisretinoic acid is a vitamin A derivative. Um, and it's used in other pediatric cancers, but we really um, recognize it as one of the hallmarks of neuroblastoma therapy. But for me as an endocrinologist, I actually think of cisretinoic acid as, as a drug that really impacts not just, you know, um, a, the, for a pediatric patient, it really has a negative effect on the skeleton. So it can cause your bones to advance, which is one of the reasons that can be a challenge because it let, let, gives you less time to grow. And then more importantly, it actually can cause premature closure of your growth plates. And that's really one of the uh, challenges that you know, contributes to the inadequate growth pattern and short stature. And as it's shown here, um, although that this was a patient after a brain tumor diagnosis that also got cisretinoic acid, so this was a child that had uh, severe growth hormone deficiency because she had cranial radiation at a young age and she was started on growth hormone treatment in the beginning, she started responding and then she actually stopped. So that, that sort of was her beginning response and she stopped you know, her treatment response. And so when we actually did the typical evaluation, which we use for the x-ray of the wrist, she had wide open growth plates, um, but really was not linearly growing. And so when we actually proceeded to get more definitive imaging of her long bones of the lower extremity, she unfortunately had fusion of her uh, lung bones in the lower extremity, which was the reason why her arm span continued to increase on growth hormone treatment, but lengthwise linearly, she actually was not um, able to grow. And that's really one of you know, the challenges with um, high doses of CISRA, cis specifically when it's uh, given to really young patients. And I think if you actually had a way to look at the growth plate, this would make it a little bit more under, it, it would give you a better understanding when I keep saying that cisretinoic acid can have uh, damaging effects on the growth plate. And so this is an MRI technique um, that in the middle, it actually, if you were to take a small section and then put it under the microscope, if you wanted to see sort of what a growth plate looks like under the microscope, as you can see, there are these nice, um, geometrically lined what's called columnar tracts. And that is very important because this is how the growth plate responds to growth hormone. These cells kind of line up on top of each other and this length actually increases. And then eventually these cells kind of move on to become part more of the hard bone. But that part of the growth plate, that integrity of the growth plate is very important. So it can actually respond to hormones like growth hormone. And so with the radiation uh, radiology technique called diffuse tensor imaging or DTI, so it's a special MRI technique, you can actually see these tracks, as you can see in these beautiful blue lines, but you can kind of appreciate how nice and long these tracks are and how parallel they are to each other. So it's sort of like a virtual bone biopsy, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but it's important to think that growth changes during childhood and especially as you go through puberty, we all think of the growth spurt of puberty and that's what's shown here on this slide. So this is a child who um, has still not gone through puberty but now they're starting to go through puberty. So these tracks, you see a lot more um, activity there. And then the, um, this is a female, so she goes through um, having a period. And so essentially after the period, uh, in the later phase of puberty, most of the growth has happened, so it starts slowing down. And then once that child has hit um, sort of the post-pubertal effects, these tracks sort of are not as organized because that's also one of the reasons we stop growing um, is that those kind of the growth plates fuse and those tracks are no longer there. And so in a study that we actually recently published in the Journal of Pediatric Radiology, um, we took we recruited high-risk neuroblastoma survivors, and we actually also recruited um, healthy controls. But for example, every, let's say, 12-year-old boy, we also made sure that we had a matched control that was also within a year, but the same race and sex, just to make sure that the comparison was actually appropriate. So as you can see here in the DTI, this is a healthy 12-year-old um, male who is a control, has not had 
prior therapy, and this is a corresponding 13-year-old um, high-risk neuroblastoma male. So again, the tracks are very uh, almost non-existent. So this is a young man who also had cis-retinoic acid. Um, and with him, he actually had uh, growth hormone deficiency and was on growth hormone, but just really was not responding. And this is another way to see um, why this young man, despite having appropriate treatment with growth hormone, really was not able to show us an improved linear growth because the tracks are just not able to be there. And that is sort of better illustrated here when we took all the patients and compared them uh, to the controls. And then as you can see here, we were able to show that the tracks actually really nicely correspond um, to your height. So those who end up having more difficulty with growth and shorter height outcome have a much shorter track. So this is sort of a way to have a virtual bone biopsy, um, but it's still, you know, from a research standpoint, but it gives you a good view into the growth plate and just is illustrating some of the effects um, of likely the cisretinoic acid impact on growth hormone. And then lastly, I do want to touch base on safe, safety of growth hormone, because I think that this is an important issue for parents of a child who's a survivor of high-risk neuroblastoma to recognize that if your child is diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency, there is always the dilemma of should I give growth hormone mainly because of risk of recurrence of the primary neuroblastoma? And I think that this to me is one of the hallmark and seminal studies um, that was uh, published by Dr. Sklar, who is a well-known endocrinologist in this area who just recently retired. But I think this to me was one of the most important contributions that Dr. Sklar did to the, um, to the field. And that basically, as it's shown here, that in over 14,000 survivors of, you know, in general childhood cancer compared to those um, who, you know, who did not, those 14,000 patients who did not need growth hormone and about 300 of those patients who actually had a diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency and treated with growth hormone, there was no increased risk of their primary cancer recurrence. And that was the same um, of the group of the individuals who also included high-risk neuroblastoma survivors. So I think that that for me is always one of the important topics that I discuss. that if a child has achieved appropriate remission and has maintained a good remission, then if there's truly growth hormone deficiency, um, that deficiency needs to be addressed because some children actually will respond to growth hormone and some not. But I do think we should pursue that and not withhold growth hormone because of a fear that really has been appropriately addressed in literature that's not uh, necessarily a concern. So I think with this, I'm gonna to shift to um, the sort of other endocrine related effects and hopefully we'll you know, have spend uh, less time on those mainly because I knew growth was a bigger uh, issue and wanted to make sure that we had a bigger understanding. Um, I think the other endocrine organ system that at least as an endocrinologist is important to think about is the thyroid related effects. And that's mainly a risk because uh, MIBG treatment certainly can have a damaging effect to the to, to the gland, and that's one of the reasons why um, SSKI drops are prescribed to help protect the thyroid, but also radiation. So again, the neuroblastoma survivors who were treated with total body radiation, or if there is mediastinal radiation to kind of help any you know um, uh, sites with neuroblastoma or residual neuroblastoma, that certainly can have a damaging effect on the radiation on the gland. So I think that that. This, gland, this uh, slide at least um, you know, portrays that in uh, survivors of childhood cancer based on radiation exposure, you have to think about thyroid related problems, whether it's overactive thyroid or underactive thyroid. Um, but the other important um, area to think about, and I think that this is gonna be more of an awareness that um, is gonna be part of how we address and provide care for survivors of high-risk neuroblastoma is the risk for thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. So we do know that high-risk neuroblastoma survivors in general are at a little bit higher risk based on, especially if they get MIBG uh, treatment or if they've had a history of radiation to the thyroid, they're at risk for thyroid nodules, but more importantly, as time goes on, at risk for thyroid cancer. And that's a reality that we know that lower doses of radiation, which is shown in this blue line, the cumulative incidence of thyroid cancer actually increases with time from that radiation exposure. 
So I do think it's important to at least think about these are not things that happen immediately after completion of your high risk neuroblastoma treatment, but it's with time. So it's usually, you know, when that child is now a teenager or a young adult, those are the patients that's important not to forget about more of a detailed evaluation of the thyroid to make sure that any abnormalities that come to attention are appropriately addressed. I think with respect to puberty, that's another challenge that can certainly be present more in females than in males. As I said, the fertility is gonna be an entire presentation on its own, but um, as, on, as it's shown on this slide, basically for a child to go through puberty, there needs to be a kind of a, a coordinated dialogue between the pituitary gland and the respective gonads. So in females, it's the ovary, and in males, it's the testes. And so for males, in response to gonadotropins or the signals from the pituitary, you make actually testosterone. And in females, you make estrogen. And eventually with ovulation, you make um, uh, progesterone. So with high risk neuroblastoma treatment, overwhelming majority of times the damage is actually at the either ovary or the testis. And that's the main reason why children may have challenges with respect to puberty. So for boys in general, um, puberty, starting puberty and going through puberty is not as much of an issue as it is for girls. But what is important to see and follow is that sometimes puberty does not complete, or sometimes those males, um, once they reach young adulthood, are no longer able to sustain to make appropriate and enough testosterone levels. So I think that that's one of the areas to you know, make sure that endocrinologists uh, follow. But in general, the damage that typically happens to the boy's uh, uh, testicle is predominantly from a chemotherapy effect and fertility, which will be covered in the next talk. But I think for girls, there's multiple possibilities. So most patients who so about 50% of girls, unfortunately, have challenges to actually start pubertal development. So they actually will need full ovarian uh, replacement. So that's something called acute ovarian failure. And a lot of times numbers alone can't really say you're gonna be absolutely in one category or next. So again, uh, follow up and time is really what I use, or at least most of us endocrinologists who have familiarity with this patient population, we at least um, use that to discern which category you fall in. And then there are patients who actually can go through puberty. They can have, you know, a girl that can actually establish having a period, but then they actually go on to stop having that appropriate ovarian function at a pretty young age. So what typically we talk as premature menopause is cessation or stopping of that normal ovarian function before uh, 40 years of age. So I think that that at least are some of the categories to think about. And estrogen is actually really important from a heart and cardiovascular standpoint, which is one of the reasons, and also for bone health. So it's really important to make sure that um, if a girl actually had a period and then they stop, that is also equally addressed as a child who actually fails to go through pubertal development. Um, and I think lastly, I wanna shift to the risk of the diabetes. And I uh, wanted to start again with one of the other uh, important figures from Dr. Diller's 2009 paper that really talks about body weight in survivors. So we know that certain cancer survivors, for example, the acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients have problems with more higher body mass index. But in general, I think high-risk neuroblastoma patients, whether you're male or female, more have challenges with body mass indexes that are on the lower side. So these are not individuals who you expect obesity. But what's really a dichotomy, so again, these are not obese individuals, but what we see is increased insulin resistance. And this actually can be a lot more challenging if the patient has untreated growth hormone deficiency. Um, so what we are worried about is, again, total body radiation and abdominal radiation in combination with the gonadal failure from alkylating chemotherapy really can put you at risk for, um, you know, basically developing insulin resistance. And that certainly can become a challenge. A lot of these patients, despite being very, very slender, start having uh, effects with, um, you know, insulin resistance and diabetes requiring treatment, um, you know, at a fairly young age, usually in young adulthood. And I think that that's also been recognized in patients who've had total body radiation exposure. So there was a period of time that both, for example, at Boston and CHOP, we were giving total body radiation. So these are survivors now who are in their 20s um, and these patients are developing diabetes mellitus. So I think it's equally an important you know, challenge to see. And Dr. Cohen also showed this with, based on just a screening test. If you look at hemoglobin A1C, again, survivors of high risk neuroblastoma over time are gonna have a much higher hemoglobin A1C compared to the norm. 
And then Dr. Friedman actually at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering did a beautiful study in high-risk neuroblastoma survivors. And what she really was able to uh, show was that this diabetes risk is actually directly correlated with the radiation dose uh, to the pancreas. And that's like a linear correlation up to a certain dose, so the 10 uh, sonograts, And then after that, it just sort of declines. And the reason for that is really some of the damaging effects on your cells that make insulin. And it's not like you completely destroy them where you stop making insulin. But as you get older and then with the effects of fat in the liver, fat in the abdomen, there's going to be more of a resistance where you're not able to make enough insulin to overcome that resistance. So I know this was a whirlwind of information. Again, this was just touching the surface as I think uh, endocrine related disorders are the forefront of challenge of high risk neuroblastoma survivors. Um, I do think that is important that you know survivors of this uh, cancer actually are treated by endocrinologists who have experience and expertise in the area because it certainly may be a little bit different than some of the regular endocrine related issues that they address. It's also from a, as a parent's perspective and also as the survivor themselves, it's important to understand that some of these endocrine related disorders may not show up immediately but may be more manifest over time. And that's one of the reasons that long term surveillance, even uh, when you reach adulthood, needs to you know, continue and that we need more research and these research studies need to continue more from a longitudinally to look at these patients um, over time and specifically to kind of get a better understanding, for example, for the mechanisms, what is the mechanism for um, diabetes mellitus. So I think a lot of those are certainly areas to, you know, look into further. So I think with that, I wanted to now, I thank all of you for spending the last few minutes to um, listen to this. And this is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a place that I called home. And I wanted to thank the grant support that made some of the studies that I reviewed with you. And then lastly, I wanted to make sure I uh, shared if there's any specific questions. This is the endo late effects email that, um, you know, certainly if you have any specific questions for me, I know there's going to be a dedicated uh, uh, question and answer sessions. But if you needed to reach out to me more on a one-on-one um, -on -one basis with any questions about your child, this is an email to you. So with that, I wanted to thank you all and I will um, pass on the presentation to Dr. Uh, Sands. So let me just uh, try to cue it up for, here we go. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to present today. Um, it's a great opportunity, and I'm also thrilled that because of this technology, parents uh, and survivors are able to join from around the country and around the world. Um, today, my goal is to briefly review the neuropsychological uh, studies that have involved neuroblastoma, as well as social, emotional, behavioral, and quality of life of equal importance, and then talk about interventions for neuropsychological and cognitive and academic challenges, as well as interventions for um, social emotional functioning. Um, there will be times because there isn't enough, there isn't sufficient research on neuroblastoma survivors, unfortunately. Uh, so sometimes I'll pull from other uh, pediatric oncology studies just to make some salient points that are uh, apply equally. Uh, so in general, uh, pediatric cancer patients, um, those who are at highest risk are the, for neuropsychological deficits primarily are those who have received therapies that target their central nervous system, which is their brain and spine. Uh, and so therefore, it specifically includes those who are treated for ALL, roughly plus or minus in the States, and it may not apply equally around the world, but roughly 30%, and brain tumor patients uh, roughly around 20% in the United States. But I wanted to emphasize they can also sometimes include other patients, such as high-risk neuroblastoma patients that I uh, see at Memorial Sloan Kettering quite a few, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, sarcoma, as well as others for reasons that we don't yet understand. And then additionally, for those who potentially have learning issues that are unrelated to their diagnosis and treatment that may have a family history of ADHD or a family history of learning disabilities. So it's important to really look at all facets. Um, so neuropsychological aid effects, there's medical uh, and um, demographic. For the medical, uh, as we mentioned just a moment ago, uh, type of cancer treatment, if it affects the CNS directly, uh, uh, tumor, metastases, implication of the brain, spine, 
Uh, also, unfortunately, those who relapse and require further additional, more intensive treatment. Um, the, in terms of the treatment modalities, um, surgery to the CNS would be a risk factor. Every time one goes in, the surgeon nurse and it goes in, you're, you're risking neurological damage. Uh, uh, cranial radiation therapy, and we have to be mindful of both the dose and the field. Um, a wider dose, uh, sorry, I'll start again, excuse me. A higher dose clearly would be more neurotoxic, but what I meant to say to you is that a wider field would also be more neurotoxic because that's bathing the whole neuraxis as opposed to focal RT would be less harmful. Um, some pediatric cancer patients get intrathecal chemotherapy, which goes in the spinal canal and intentionally passes the blood brain barrier. Uh, so that puts the brain at risk. And then as you know, parents and survivors know all too well, certain chemotherapies have late effects like uh, cisplatin, carboplatin for uh, high frequency hearing loss, and Christine for um, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and then bone marrow transplant, while some regimens use BMT, um, they, uh, the preparative regimen of total body radiation or high dose chemotherapy, there are a variety of, of programs out there that um, use radiation TBI, others that don't, and we'll discuss those as well. Uh, in terms of demographic risk factors, uh, younger age of treatment is always a risk factor. There's no safe age. It's not as if, oh, okay, you're six, you're fine. It's, you know, um, uh, those who uh, cut the study on four, below four, above four, below six, above six, eight, et cetera, 12, is always significant findings. Um, there's no safe age, as I mentioned, but clearly those who are younger are highest, highest risk. Um, someone could, as, as I was mentioning before, could have cognitive LD, ADHD concerns before their diagnosis. We rarely, if ever, get testing pre-diagnosis. So once in a while you do, but uh, for the most part, it's talking to the parents, getting a family history, et cetera. And also time missed away from school. And what grades? Is it kindergarten, first grade, you know, formative years, um, et cetera? Uh, psychosocial factors do rear their head as well in terms of family, personal community support that parents have, which is a really uh, underappreciated aspect of, of, of how the child um, recovers and, and, and gets you know, uh, catches up and, and does well. Differences in coping and resilience for parents uh, and also uh, patients. And we'll talk about that at the end of the, of the talk. Cultural issues, there are plenty of families who English is not their first language, plenty of families who or single parents who, you know, and, and multiple kids and, and have trouble juggling all this with, without much support from the community or spouse. Um, and then advocacy and access to interventions, uh, uh, funds to either pay for or um, politic and get the your public school system to pay for private schools, uh, being able to organize therapies, whether it's occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language counseling, et cetera. These are all clearly risk factors. Um, there's no one pattern of neuropsychological deficits, but pulling from my work uh, with all pediatric cancer patients, so not specific to neuroblastoma, but I wanted to, to talk to you about the concept of core deficits and secondary deficits. So core deficits can include sustained attention concentration. It's not as if somebody can't pay attention. We all space out from time to time, all of us, including you know people online today, um, it, it's that those who've gone through treatment for pediatric cancer generally don't pay attention as much as those who are their healthy peers. And clearly it's a precursor to learning and memory. So if you're paying attention 60, 65, 70% of the rate of your peers, you're not gonna be able to remember 100% of what the teacher said. Uh, so uh, it's important to, to focus on that. Uh, processing speed, we measure it as neuropsychologists with how quickly someone can fill out some paperwork uh, with specific directions in two minutes, how many to get correct, but it's not someone's a slow writer, it's psychomotor processing speed. So it, in, it impacts their ability to read, uh, listen, uh, generate what's the problem, what are some potential solutions, what do I think is the best solution, let me put it down on paper or let me respond verbally. So it's processing speed in general, although we do measure it with paper, with, with pencil. Uh, and then fine motor dexterity would probably be more for kids who have cerebellar tumors uh, impacting their fine motor. But uh, because of that, uh, the secondary deficits are IQ, and it's not generally that their IQ 
their verbal and nonverbal skills primarily are, are um, the most impacted. It's that sustained attention concentration, which also has a working memory component we can talk about in a moment. And processing speed are two of the index scores that go into IQ. So those are pulling clearly the IQ down. Academic achievement um, can be problematic. In general, many pediatric cancer survivors struggle with mathematics. However, we'll talk in a minute about high frequency hearing loss at a young age uh, and, and the emerging literature and, and studies that confirm reading and aspects of, of speech and language being impacted. Uh, learning and memory, uh, visual motor integration and executive functioning are, are also at risk. Um, so yeah, let's talk about hearing loss for a moment. Um, so exposure to platinum containing chemotherapies, including cisplatin and carboplatin as we mentioned, can result in the destruction of cochlear sensory hair cells leading to the loss of high frequency hearing. Uh, this can impact language development, verbal abilities and reasoning skills in young children, given the simultaneous timing of their acquisition of language. Those with hearing loss in the study by Gurney um, in 2007 had twice the risk of lower reading, math and or attention as well as special education needs than those without hearing loss uh, and it's also important to appreciate at the same time that the same study noted that self-reported quality life was within normal limits, uh, normal range, based on questionnaires sent to 137 neuroblastoma survivors from two different children's oncology group studies. Another um, uh, sequelae, which uh, some, many of you are uh, familiar with and unfortunate uh, have experienced is obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome. It's an acute neurological disorder that affects approximately two to 3% of patients with neuroblastoma and characterized by involuntary chaotic eye movements, myoclonic uh, limb jerking, ataxia and irritability in the first two years of life. In terms of long-term outcomes, they do vary a bit. Um, and you can see a few things that there's a few studies and also they're from a long while ago. So there's really a paucity in general thematically for neuroblastoma, which is unfortunate. And, I'm glad conferences such as this are, are coalescing, bringing together experts. Uh, so CO identified persistent delays in learning or development in nine out of 10 survivors after a mean follow-up of 4.5 years. So clearly 90% um, uh, in slight moderate contrast, Hayward uh, focused on 11 survivors followed for a mean of 11, uh, sorry, 7.6 years, excuse me. And neurological evaluations were often abnormal, although half of the survivors were functioning in the average range on testing. So the point here would be that if one is diagnosed with obstaclonus myoclonus, uh, it's not necessarily going to be um, problematic for everyone. However, I get uh, plenty of referrals of people who've had this syndrome. And yes, there are some uh, kids who, who clearly have uh, cognitive deficits uh, afterwards that persist. Um, I wanted to also just review some uh, research on high-risk neuroblastoma. Uh, want to be brief, but I want to be thorough. Um, there's 16 high-risk neuroblastoma patients who were tested six years post-treatment uh, in Boston, uh, quite a, a wide range of 1.6 to 13 years. Um, half received total body radiation as a preparative regimen for transplant, and those were more like those people uh, patients were more likely to have stage four neuroblastoma. And there was no difference between the groups on cognition and behavior. The group in general had above-average verbal IQ and full-scale IQ for 50% uh, of the population and 94% had superior performance on one of the tasks that was administered, and 69% had superior performance on five or more tasks. So that's very impressive. And academic, physical, and social functioning was within normal limits. So begs the question, why do these high-risk neuroblastoma kids, why did they do so well? No one has a clear answer, but some thoughts about it are that, uh, in this instance, getting treatment during preschool years may stimulate language and socialization through increased adult interactions um, that you uh, um, have, you know, with nurses, physicians, you know, OT, PT, uh, just being, you know, around so many people getting stimulated. Uh, the hearing status in this study did not impact verbal development uh, as uh, they hypothesized it was corrected with hearing aids for the high frequency hearing loss. Um, I think some more salient possible solutions uh, reside in some of these uh, thoughts that 50% of the parents in the study received post high school degrees. There's a high correlation you know, in terms of genetics for education. Uh, also those 57% of the parents who agreed to participate 
may have had more available support, resources, et cetera. And 75% um, were females in the study versus 25% males. Uh, you can conclude what you want, but uh, this is suggesting that uh, girls are inherently uh, brighter, which uh, I would not argue. Um, late effects of bone marrow transplant without total body radiation as a preparative regimen. There's a study in 2003 with 76 children treated for an extracranial tumor with BMT without TBI, and they were evaluated at least minimum five years post treatment. So overall performance was within the normal range and uh, their professional and academic outcomes were satisfactory. Nevertheless, the researchers observed a harmful effect of deafness uh, on verbal IQ skills and your reading skills associated with the previous administration of cisplatin. And this could be, uh, in this instance, related to absence from kindergarten or primary school during hospitalization. And I'm well aware that this hypothesis is in direct contrast to the Carpenter study that said maybe it's because they weren't in school, but they were around nurses and doctors and staff and, and they were stimulated. So you have both hypotheses being borne out in different studies. Finally, in the younger subgroup, visual perceptual skills, which is, is clearly right hemispheric and different from left hemispheric language, uh, was found to be more fragile in 60%. Uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in 2005, um, they have a BMT protocol that also does not include TBI as a preparative regimen. I looked at 63 advanced stage neuroblastoma patients uh, with a mean age of diagnosis of three years old, standard protocol um, uh, of radiation to primary site after resection and chemotherapy. And radiation was to the abdomen, chest, and uh, three out of 15 did get cranial whole brain, whole brain radiation and 12 out of 15 did get orbital skull, spine, uh, or TBI, chemotherapy included cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, cisplatin, and etoposide. And just last slide for the study is saying, yes, yeah, 62% had hearing loss associated with cisplatin, but they, they did not find a dose relationship. I know others have. Uh, half had loss within speech range. 16% uh, had visual problems with majority receiving orbital RT for preorbital disease. That was a late effect from the RT to, to that region. 13% had neurocognitive problems low IQ or ADHD, um, and half received cranial RT and half had autologous transplant, but none had TBI, which uh, was the backbone of, of this study. So I just wanna switch gears uh, and talk about developmental expectations uh, briefly. Um, so if it varies by grade and age. So if someone's in the first or second grade, roughly in the States, I know it's specific to United States, I apologize. It, it, it's different in other countries and I respect that. Uh, in the America, grades one through two, you're learning uh, core academic skills, phonological skills, which are the basis of reading, being able to uh, rapidly name uh, in terms of uh, expressive language, numeracy is a fancy word for your emerging math skills, and also socialization, being in a classroom and learning how to sit and pay attention and take turns. Um, grades four to five kids um, are no longer um, learning to read. They're now reading to learn chapter books, et cetera, and self-monitoring. Uh, by grade seven, they're changing classrooms often, have multiple demands. They start juggling many things and start the executive functioning, frontal lobes start to um, take over. Expectations for planning and time management. When you have a paper due in three weeks, you have two tests later this week, uh, and less teacher involvement, support to not holding your hand, and clearly peer pressure. Um, and then high school and beyond, there's academic pressure, clearly with increased workload, post-secondary planning, uh, dating and sexual relationships, all in the mix to, to make high school and beyond challenging. So interventions by age and development is important to be mindful. So in primary grades in the States, that would be, you know, um, our first grade through, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, would be to identify those who have specific areas of deficit, and that's easiest done through testing, neuropsych testing, um, which is, uh, you know, could be several hours of testing. It's fun, it's engaging. You look, we all have peaks and valleys. There are certain things that we're good at and certain things that are hard for us. I feel like brain tumor survivors specifically, but also cancer patients have wider uh, peaks and valleys. So it's really about better understanding their strengths and identifying areas that are hard for them so the plans in the states is an individualized education plan or a 504 plan. I'm happy to talk to people later about the difference. 
uh, would lead to accommodation so that teachers can challenge the child up here, but support them down here. Uh, and it needs to be clearly identified their pattern as well as students understanding their strengths and weaknesses so they can in turn also study more effectively, plan their time more effectively, take tests uh, more effectively. In adolescence, uh, behavioral and emotional regulation is critically important, independent study skills, their organization and planning, not only of their materials, but of themselves and their time. And then high school and beyond, self-advocacy, a critically important skill to be able to speak up on your behalf, college support. Some children don't want to go to college. Maybe it's not the right choice for them. So there's also vocational training that may be appropriate for others. So in terms of interventions, what, you know, what have we done so far in the field? Um, I could talk for you know, an hour just on this one topic. Um, and I'm happy to, I'll give you my email later. I'm happy to discuss this further, but for the sake of this presentation, I needed to be uh, concise. So we'll spend a minute on here though. Uh, so there's two intervention tracks. One is behavioral, one's pharmacological. Um, I will say at the outset that we have not, it's the holy grail, we have not yet figured out um, what works best and for whom. We're trying and we're doing the studies, but, but there's no, clear, no clarity yet, unfortunately, but we're you know, on, the, on the hunt. So for behavioral, research on the impact of cognitive remediation programs include computerized programs such as CogMed, which uh, have younger versions and older versions. Maybe a few adults have in the room here um, who are watching know about Lumosity. Basically it's adaptive computer training that gets, as you get more proficient, it gets harder. And it's uh, essentially training aspects of visual memory given the computer screen, sustained visual attention to detail, uh, working memory I referenced before means keeping something in your head for 30 seconds or so and doing something with it, like doing math problems in your head without paper and pencil um, to train again, sustained attention concentration and working memory. The results are that for these computerized programs, people are doing well on tests of attention, working memory, et cetera, before the CogMed and after, and people are finishing the program. However, what's not clear is if it transfers to school or the workplace. And, and that's, that's the missing, is it generalizable? And, and that's a really huge question mark. I just wanted to also highlight physical exercise. Um, there's a discussion about recruiting neural precursor cells uh, in animal models. And a colleague from um, Don Mabbitt from uh, Toronto Sick Kids also did an exercise where kids exercise three days a week. and. Um, you know, worked up a mist, you know, they weren't sweating and panting excessively, uh, and that on testing they improved. And interestingly, the size of the hippocampus, which is a region in the brain that, that, uh, work, that consolidates memory, also grew during the exercise, but also after they finished. So all that to say, it's an underappreciated, underutilized uh, approach. Uh, pharmacological is research on the impact of medication to approve things like attention concentration, which has been one of the most challenging areas for uh, cancer survivors um, that has huge impacts about learning in the classroom. Um, and uh, yes, brain tumor, leukemia, but, but not only. Um, so methylphenidate is Ritalin. Uh, essentially, I want to be brief, but 75% uh, of kids who are diagnosed with ADHD or healthy uh, benefit from taking Ritalin. Uh, and, contrast to 45% of uh, cancer survivors, brain tumor survivors. So clearly there's something about a brain tumor survivor and cancer survivor's brain that's different from healthy control. I also wanted to say that those who are male, those who are, uh, have higher IQ, those who have display more symptoms at diagnosis of ADHD tend to do better. Um, these last two, Provigil and Metformin, are completely experimental. They're off-label uses. So we can have a discussion. It's, it's not something that's approved. They're under research currently. Provigil is an anti-narcolepsy medication that helps with the sleep-wake center of the brain. Uh, it's very helpful with adults and we struggled to, to uh, study it uh, with pediatric patients because many parents didn't want their children to be on medication given what they had been through through the treatment. And metformin is a, something that's being studied now. It's a diabetes medication that also tends to recruit neural precursor cells and, and the studies are ongoing. So they're off-label and have not been approved yet for, for use, but the research is ongoing. So for interventions, we need to better understand what groups, what specific groups may respond to interventions. 
along with targets? Do we look at attention? Do we look at memory, processing speed, academics, as well as the timing? Is earlier better? Is during, so therefore would during treatment be better? Many studies, or a uh, few actually, I apologize, uh, have tried during treatment and the kids are too tired to do these interventions. So there may be a too early, uh, or is it right after treatment? Or can we go well into survivorship? as well as what components to use. So is it computer-based helpful, pharmacologic, exercise, parent training, and which personnel do we use to provide interventions? We use medical staff, parents, school staff. So for example, if exercise is important, maybe these kids sh shouldn't have adaptive phys ed and, and sit around. They should be exercising. They should be doing yoga, stretching, you know, or appropriate exercise uh, at the school, uh, just for one example. So I just wanted to also switch gears to psychosocial and um, quality life overview. Uh, I'm mindful of the time and you know, I wanna make sure we have time for talks and your questions. So most studies have found little evidence of serious maladjustment in pediatric cancer patients. In fact, reviews of chronic illness studies found that kids with cancer were actually at no greater risk for long-term emotional sequelae than a healthy population. And that was by parent report, self-report, teacher report. However, um, there does remain a subgroup of survivors, approximately 10 to 20%, who suffer long lasting social and emotional problems and display trauma related psychological distress and deficiencies in social competence that can result in isolation from peers, tends to not exclusively, but impact, uh, involve those who have physical late effects or functional impairments upon poor psychological adjustment, brain tumors, bone tumors, and self to CNS. I wanna pause for a second to be, uh, provide anecdotal information. I had the good fortune of presenting at uh, this conference when it was in San Francisco and uh, host um, sit in on a group of uh, high school students, uh, all neuroblastoma survivors, and it was eye-opening. Yes, we've already talked in this discussion about he high-frequency hearing loss and uh, associated with reading delays, speech and language delays, you know, absolutely, um, trouble hearing the teacher, but what wasn't readily apparent until I heard the students uh, all talking, the high school students in San Francisco last year, or, or maybe it was two years ago, is um, the social aspects. So two things, one in the classroom, when kids are whispering to each other and uh, uh, neuroblastoma kids say, oh yeah, what'd you say, what'd you say? Oh, never mind, never mind, because they don't want to get in trouble and they don't repeat it. So clearly missing out on the banter, which is happening during a class, but also outside of class when there's groups of kids and everyone's chatting and laughing and giggling and that, uh, many neuroblastoma patients who have high frequency hearing loss can't follow the conversation and can't pick up on uh, what's being said and what's being laughed about. So they feel isolated and they tend to kind of just laugh along, uh, but they have no idea really what's, what's being said. Um, um, also additionally being you know, short of stature uh, and other uh, aspects of physical aid effects uh, make it harder to fit in socially. So the psychological part of withdrawal and uh, social isolation is clearly present. Um, I wanted to say quality of life really briefly is not a number. It's pulling from things like your emotional well-being, your social with peers, your functional in school or sports, and your physical. So there's, it's multifactorial that drives a quality of life. So following up on what I was just telling you, pediatric oncology uh, survivors tend to have more internalizing symptoms such as in general anxiety, depression, mood, as opposed to externalizing, which would be aggressiveness, conduct disorder, you know, um, creating a uh, uh, physical problems. So because of that, it's uh, more withdrawn, more social, uh, more social, excuse me, isolation, more somatization, uh, bodily complaints of pain, lowered uh, level of uh, leadership ability, lowered self-esteem, lowered intimacy with peers. And uh, this slide speaks volumes about what it's like from the social, emotional and behavioral standpoint, which is uh, many would argue, and we'd all agree that is as important as the academic component. So just a handful of uh, slides that look at the quality of life. This one's from 2000, uh, comparison of quality of life between parents and patients treated for Wilms tumor and advanced neuroblastoma did not detect a significant difference in overall quality of life, although, it, they note that neuroblastoma uh, did uh, report lower quality of life. There was a significant difference noted with increased deficits in hearing and speech of neuroblastoma as a consequence of platinum-based chemo. And the heterogeneity of treatment for advanced neuroblastoma makes conclusions very difficult, but morbidity is great 
as you're hearing today and you'll continue to hear and you guys are experiencing firsthand and more variability from early regimens with intensified treatments that are thankfully becoming less and less toxic. Um, a different study from 2007, the health related quality of life questionnaire was mailed uh, to 432 adult survivors and 654 adult survivors of Wilms tumor. Uh, on average, survivors reported no decline on the physical quality of life, but both groups did score significantly below norms, age norms, on the psychological quality of life, which reflects decreased emotional health. I just wanted to say that picking up on the last slide, these people were treated since they're so old now on much older, more toxic regimens. Uh, that's important just to keep in mind. Uh, um, just rounding the corner, we're finishing up. I did wanna also mention, it's important to talk about an emerging area of research in the field, which is the role of parents and could that be a risk factor? And yes, the research so far, it's, it's emerging, but that shows a high level of parental, especially maternal distress and family dysfunction, such as lower cohesion, excessive control, can be associated with increased behavioral, emotional, or social difficulties of the pediatric oncology survivor. So parents therefore buffer the impact of stressful experiences on their children with parental coping and better family functioning, explaining the variance in psychological adaptation of survivors. So the next steps, and this is the last slide, the next steps for parent support then are, how do we quickly screen? What tools can we use to quickly screen to, uh, that can predict parental and family risk factors like significant stress, poor coping, emotional or behavioral difficulties, as well as limited financial or social resources, which are vital in order to indirectly improve the pediatric patient coping and resilience. And this proactive identification would then maximize our resources to effectively minimize current levels of parental stress to improve long-term psychological, cognitive, and that should also, yeah, effects of medical treatment. And this is something while we can't change the chemotherapy regimen, can't change the radiation regimen, if we can screen and provide support to parents, preferably early at diagnosis and during treatment, but also during survivorship, that's something that we can lean in and provide support and in, uh, have an impact on this aspect um, and have an indirect outcome, positive outcome on, on the patient and survivor. So uh, I know we have a long agenda today, so I'll be brief. Just wanted to say we, um, we're all here to answer questions today. And here is my email uh, moving forward. If anyone wants to reach out, more than happy to engage over email. So thank you so much for your time and attention. I apologize, I wanna introduce Dr. Diller, uh, who's an esteemed colleague. Um, we'll talk about health after neuroblastoma. And Dr. Diller, this is Nicole. We can't hear you, you'll just have to unmute your mic. There you Great, go. Great, thanks. You'd think after six months of being on Zoom, I would know this, but there you go. Um, thank you for having me. I have been at the Dana-Farber for over 30 years, and when I started here, the cure rates for neuroblastoma, especially high-risk neuroblastoma, were very poor, and low and intermediate-risk neuroblastoma, what we call now, was treated very, very aggressively. So at the same time, we've been able to reduce the aggressiveness of therapy for low and intermediate-risk neuroblastoma. We've also changed therapy for high-risk neuroblastoma so that now we have more and more survivors of high-risk neuroblastoma. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on both. I'm kind of an expert in neuroblastoma and also an expert in survivorship, um, but not an endocrinologist or a psychologist or a fertility expert or a cardiologist. So I'll give you what expertise I can. I always like to start with a case when I'm teaching. Um, this is one of my um, oldest and dearest patients. Um, she was diagnosed at age three in 1994 with high-risk neuroblastoma and was treated with five cycles of chemotherapy and then got her um, big tumor mass resected, um, had radiation to her uh, abdomen where her tumor had been, and then went and had what we call tandem transplant, basically one transplant followed by another. When she was six, she was noted to have abnormal thyroid function tests and started on thyroid hormone. When she was 10, she had very slow growth. When she was 12, it was clear she wasn't gonna go through puberty without some help with um, taking estrogen, which she started 
when she was 14. I have to admit she had a pretty rough high school time, um, sort of looking and feeling different than her peers. When she was 18, she graduated from high school and told me she didn't want me to be her doctor anymore. She wanted to have um, an adult provider. So she went on to be cared for by uh, an internist, someone in internal medicine. We don't really have GPs here in Boston. So the major questions are, as, as more high-risk patients survive longer, what's the outcome for them? Does the tumor come back? What are the risks from all the different therapies they get? Surgery, radiation, chemo, some of the newer agents that some of you on the chat have been asking about. Do we understand anything more about genetics and what happens when they get older in age? That we don't know. Can we identify intervention strategies to reduce long-term late toxicity? In other words, how do we best take care of our survivors? And then for children who have low or intermediate risk neuroblastoma and their long-term survivors, what are the remaining issues for their survivorship care? Um, this is a paper of a large group of childhood cancer survivors studying um, what happens to them after the beyond the five years. This particular paper talks about mortality, um, passing away from a toxicity, but there are other papers that um, Goli talked about that have to do with morbidity or sort of what chronic illnesses they um, face. And in general, for children who were treated in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and survived at, at least five years, the risk to their health, meaning recurrence and severe late toxicity, have generally gone down. That's sort of the take home for the paper. But if you look carefully at the paper and try to understand neuroblastoma, what you find is, is that although the five year, if you survive five years, the risk of recurrence um, at 15 years has gone down depending upon what era you were treated in, the 70s, 80s, or 90s. That's for leukemia, the first set of graphs. And then for the next set of graphs for Hodgkin's disease, again, the risk of having a recurrence and passing away from it has gone down. But neuroblastoma, on the other hand, it's gone up. Well, that's not good news, or, or maybe, maybe it is. And the same is true uh, to a less extent with health, health risks. So the risk of having severe late toxicity has gone down through the decades for leukemia, for Wilms tumor, which is a kidney tumor, but for neuroblastoma has at least stayed the same if not gotten worse. So what's that about? Maybe it's not such bad news. Any studies of five-year survivors of neuroblastoma including, include low, intermediate, and high-risk patients, but those early cohorts, the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s, include very few high-risk patients. We can tell that because of the therapy they got and because of what we know about how people were treated in those days. More recently treated cohorts will have high-risk survivors, so it'll make things look like they're getting worse, even if they're not getting worse. Just a touching on low and intermediate risk therapy, um, historically there was good disease control in the 70s, 80s with um, aggressive chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And more recently, most of the clinical trials that we've done worldwide in pediatric oncology support the success of what we call reduction of therapy trials, meaning we identify those patients with clinical and biologic factors who are less likely to need aggressive therapy and we just use as little therapy as possible, try to use radiation as little as possible, surgery the same, and then the total dosing of chemotherapy has gone down. Now, even surgery, even if you don't have any chemotherapy, just having surgery and removal of a tumor can put you at risk for late effects. In this example, a study that we did recently of intestinal obstruction. On the left here, you can see just an x-ray that shows someone whose bowel isn't quite working. It's filled with air, and the air is getting stuck in the, in the bowel loop. So that's the pattern that you see on x-ray. This is usually um, treated with bowel rest, sometimes a, a tube to decompress the bowel, um, hospitalization often. And that occurs um, as over time, even if you get surgery only. Um, so uh, here's the late intestinal obstruction curve. So over time, beyond five years, as you become an adult, your risk just from having had surgery alone as a child um, goes up. So what are the next steps in low and intermediate risk therapy? Let's figure out who doesn't need surgery, who we can just watch. In some countries in Europe, I believe in Germany, um, the groups have expanded the numbers of kids um, based upon specific criteria who are just watched and we're watching carefully for those results. To determine who can get fewer cycles of therapy. If we do do surgery, can we do less aggressive surgery? 
And then as uh, Steve mentioned, Dr. Sands mentioned, uh, there are conditions that are associated with late toxicity, even in children who have low and intermediate risk disease like opsoclonus myoclonus or like spinal cord compression, and how do we improve care for those children? Now I'm gonna focus on high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, this is a compilation of what we know, kind of the burden of toxicity based upon organ system from a bunch of different series, some of which um, my colleagues have touched upon already, just to show you that there's great variability between um, different studies about what the outcomes are and the percentage of kids that have a problem in that outcome. Sometimes the, uh, that risk is low in a specific group because they didn't even look at that group. And for some, um, it's pretty uniform that, for example, hearing loss is a significant problem in most studies. We're trying to improve upon this with a study that we're doing going forward. Um, Bully and I are involved in a large study of high-risk neuroblastoma patients treated in the modern era, and we'll hopefully have time to talk about that at the end. But what are the themes emerging? Um, one theme that you already heard about is endocrine risk. Another theme you heard about is uh, growth. Another is uh, learning and adaptation. And one, another is second neoplasm risk, or the developing not of a recurrence of neuroblastoma, but a secondary cancer. We know that using radiation, no matter what disease you had, get radiation can cause cancers. We've seen bone and soft tissue tumors after radiation, and kids have had abdominal radiation, so we're keeping our eyes open for other abdominal tumors, like colon cancer, for example, um, is one that we'll be looking for in the adults. It doesn't really usually occur in, um, in children who are survivors. As we study children who've had childhood cancer and a particular high-risk neuroblastoma, we're looking out for um, understanding the genes that are associated with these syndromes that might help us define what second tumors children are at risk for. We've also learned that not all solid tumors that occur are occur, if you didn't get radiation, it doesn't mean you're free of the risk of another solid tumor. And that probably has to do with some cancer predisposition syndrome that we don't understand. The chemo that we give can cause myeloid leukemia. Um, I probably, if your child has gotten some of these drugs, you were told that there was a low risk of developing a leukemia from the chemotherapy itself. What we found is nearly all of those leukemias only happen in the first 10 years afterwards, and most of them even earlier than that. And the other thing we're seeing is that benign growths are observed frequently, um, both osteochondromas, which you see over here, little bumps in the bone that don't belong. This is a, a bone, nor that's what a normal bone should look like. And obviously there's this little bump there that's growing. Those are benign. Um, they can cause deformity. They can sometimes be annoying or painful. Um, but in general, we just leave them alone and follow them. And then we see benign growths in the liver as well. There have been a couple of questions, so I'm glad I have this, um, Looking, asking about new therapies for high-risk neuroblastoma and whether we understand anything about the late effects of those. Um, I-131 MIVG um, as a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic um, needs to be studied. Isotretinoin, also known as Accutane or retinoic acid, was touched on um, pretty substantially by Goli, so I'll probably pass on that. Immunotherapy and ALK inhibitors are drugs for which we will have more and more survivors having experienced. Um, MIBG late effects, um, hypothyroidism with a wide range of incidents, hard to know exactly what the percentage risk of hypothyroidism if you have MIBG therapy. We use the potassium iodide drops to try to um, prevent that as well as thyroid nodules. Second cancers have been seen after MIBG therapy, and they're a funny group of cancers. So um, we're just, it's a low risk, but we're keeping our eyes open on that. Infertility, it's very hard to know because most of the kids who get MIBG therapy also get other drugs that, were, that are associated with infertility. In fact, almost all patients who've been treated with MIBG therapy have had other therapies that are associated with the same overlapping late effects. So it's a little bit hard to tease this out. Ovarian failure has been seen in girls after MIBG. Um, this was a one paper where they really could isolate the exposure to um, MIBG therapy. Um, you can see in this picture, the MIBG is being taken up by the neuroblastoma. This is MIBG 
in um, the tumor itself, and then you know that the um, the ovaries are right there, so they're getting radiation. And so we it makes sense, albeit low dose radiation, the radiation is affecting um, the ovaries. Isotretinoin and long term toxicity was really um, touched on by Goli. In the interest of time, I will skip over this. Most of the um, late effects have been due to bone and impact upon bone growth um, and bone age and the closure of the growth plates. There's really not much known about the late effects of immunotherapy. There's been no reported significant late effects with anti-GD2 immunotherapy that I'm aware of. There are many acute complications. If your child has gone through um, this therapy, you know that, but so far they do not appear to be associated with late toxicities. And if we look at other immune therapies that have been experimented with aren't really part of the treatment yet, we don't have any information. So people are working on, for example, antineuroblastoma CAR T cells and other immunotherapeutic strategies, and we have no information about survivorship in those. What about ALK inhibition? Um, you may be familiar with a drug called crizotinib, um, which is the one we've used the most. What will it, its long-term toxicity be? And again, we really don't have long-term effects. Adults um, have had um, some long-term effects that we have not seen in children, um, visual disturbances, renal cysts, interstitial lung disease, and hepatotoxicity. But these are older adults with adult onset cancers. It's hard to tease out what's coming from the chrysotinib. We do know that similar drugs, the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have had an impact on growth and possibly organ function like cardiac function um, in kids that have been on these drugs for many years. So we'll be keeping our eyes open for that as well. We're learning more and more about genetic risk for late effects. Um, the, we up till now have not had large numbers of samples with knowing what the, who the sample's from and what late effect they've had. So we haven't been able to make associations, but more and more, I think we're going to find out that there are some people who are more at risk for second cancers than others. Some people who are more, uh, more at risk for platinum related hearing loss than others, ovarian failure risk, and um, anthracycline cardiotoxicity or risk from the the drug called uh, doxorubicin or adriamycin, um, mitoxantrone uh, is the, one of the European used drugs, and that class of drugs associated with cardiac toxicity. It's not used in high enough doses in neuroblastoma for the most part. Um, in any case, so I think oh, in the future we'll be learning more and more about who's at risk, and then we'll figure out what to do with that. I was asked to touch on fertility preservation. Again, I'm not really an expert, but I will tell you um, that um, the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology puts out guidelines about um, uh, different aspects of care of patients with cancer, um, the adult and pediatric. And I was very pleased that in the fertility guidelines um, that were published by this group that they, um, uh, I assume that Hamish Wallace had something to do with this, that they did make recommendations around children. And the recommendation was that we use established methods of fertility preservation, i.e. semen or oocyte cryopreservation, I'll tell you what those are in a minute, for post-pubertal children. And for pre-pubertal children, the fertility options are investigational. Unfortunately, most neuroblastoma patients, as you know, are, are pre-pubertal. For boys with a new diagnosis of neuroblastoma, um, one, it should be said that most of the intermediate or low risk regimens won't be associated with um, a high risk of azoospermia or low sperm count. For boys that are post-pubertal, sperm banking is a relatively easy uh, intervention that can preserve sperm for later use. Um, for boys who can't produce a sperm specimen but are post-pubertal, you can do something under anesthesia called testicular sperm extraction, which sort of is what it sounds like. Um, and then the third is basically um, doing a small biopsy or sampling of testicular tissue and frying that, uh, freezing that, and then hopefully being able to use that in the future as a source for developing something that, that can fertilize an egg. I show this picture only to remind you that it only takes one sperm. 
um, with modern technologies, um, getting one sperm is into an egg is possible for boys with very low sperm counts. So that those of you whose sons, or if you in fact are a survivor of neuroblastoma should consider a low sperm count to be very different than having no sperm. Um, for girls, the risk, as, as Goli suggested, the risk for ovaries that aren't working properly um, include exposure to alkylating agents, radiation to the abdomen and pelvis. Most transplant regimens will um, cause the ovaries to not work properly and radiation to the brain. By not working properly, that can mean that a child won't go through puberty normally or that she'll go through puberty, but she'll have trouble getting pregnant or go through early menopause. And the options are oocyte preservation or getting an egg out of that ovary and freezing it, embryo preservation, which means getting an egg and fertilizing that egg and freezing it, usually not an option in the girls that we're talking about because you need to sort of figure out who the father is going to be, and ovarian tissue preservation, which likes like testicular tissue preservation is kind of like having a small biopsy. So the issue for parents of girls with neuroblastoma are should we preserve ovarian tissue and oocytes? Well, it could result in a delay in therapy. It could be costly. The procedure itself has risks. There's a risk of sacrificing one ovary or going into an ovary and taking pieces of it, which you know might contribute to eventual puberty or fertility that would have happened. You can't really know 100% with girls. The risk of transmission of neoplasia, could there be neuroblastoma in that slice of ovary that you freeze away? And then there isn't a lot of information about how successful pregnancies are um, in uh, getting pregnancies and how healthy those pregnancies are, those babies are. We just have not had enough children go through this. And then what about survivors? Um, I would remind you um, if you have uh, now post-pubertal or uh, teenage or young adult girls, one of the things to consider is if she is still cycling, is freezing away oocytes now. We do have a study, how am I doing with time? Can't see a clock on my, um, we're good, okay. Um, I think that I'm gonna say thank you and leave time. We only have till three o'clock. I'm gonna leave time for questions. Um, I wanna thank the organizers of the conference and you the parents who work so hard to be informed to those organizations that have, friend, found, have funded my work and many others to your children and you for agreeing to participate in research and for my colleagues in the fields of pediatric and medicine and other fields, endocrinology, psychology, who are engaged in the care and in research on childhood cancer, especially in neuroblastoma. I didn't want to take up all the time for questions, so we can go back to some of those issues if you want. Nicole, well, thank you're going you. to the questions, right? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dillard. That was a, a really great presentation, well, all three of them. And um, maybe because we do have only a little bit of time, it's great that we can jump to some questions. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure how you feel about maybe sharing your presentations later so that panelists or so participants um, will be able to see them. Um, maybe we can have them through Solving Kids Cancer uh, and send them out because we did miss some of your slides, uh, Dr. Dillard, and I think it would have been interesting. Uh, but you can let us know that later on. Um, for the questions, my first question, there's quite a few in the Q&A, so I want to try to get to as many as I can. Um, I've also prepared for this, uh, this webinar ahead of time, the symposium ahead of time, by asking a lot of uh, parents of childhood cancer survivors and also of adult survivors of uh, pediatric cancer, some, what, would, what would be their main question if they had a panel of experts in front of them? Um, surprisingly, they had a lot of the same types of uh, questions. The survivors had one main question that kept coming up was, what was my treatment? A lot of them don't even know, um, which brings me to what a lot of the parents asked, and that is, how do I do the kind of transfer of control 
I'm the parent now, I'm bringing my child to the center. I know this is a general question, it's not in specific the way your presentations were, but as a parent who is now, I'm in charge of my child, bringing him into the, the different specialists, and then they grow up, they become adults, I need to transfer it to that child. Sure, the, the young adults who are survivors can ask for a copy of their file. A lot of the time, it's very hard to understand those documents when you look at them. And there's a lot of places where there are not long-term follow-up centers or clinics or specialty uh, you know specialists that deal with that and and when you're an adult you had pediatric cancer obviously you don't go to your pediatric oncologists um, you don't go to an adult oncologist because you don't have cancer um, so you go to your family doctor who's not a specialist what would you say for what would you advise parents or survivors in in this what would you advise them to do um, or how would you address this um, so I have a couple of thoughts. One, I was trying to show a slide that sort of shows the team approach. I don't know if it's showing anymore, but um, the um, one is that this is a process. So I wouldn't say like at, for any for any adult um, or any parent, like there's an age at which it has to switch. And that the sooner you, um, engage the child in the process, the better off you are. I often say to my like seventh grader, Steve, maybe that's the right developmental age, seventh grader, eighth grader kids, do you want to do a presentation about neuroblastoma for your science project? Like get them to be thinking about this um, as they go forward. I tell, I talk to kids about graduating from high school means, you know, getting ready when you graduate from high school, you're going to be responsible for certain things. But I don't do that the June of graduation of high school. I do it like when they start high school and start talking about what you're going to have to sort of know about. And I'll ask the kids, what did you have? What was the name of it? Not the chemotherapy. You don't need to know the names of the drugs, but like, do you even know the, the, the diagnosis, you know? So I think using early to mid adolescence as a way to prepare for adult care is a really helpful thing that I think about. I know that you think, or you mentioned that um, some people think those sort of like survivorship care plans or whatever are too technical. I, we found ways, and I, I would encourage people to go back to their primary, their primary treating oncologist and ask them for that information in a way that you can understand it. There are websites that can do that for you as well, where you can put your information in and generate kind of like a care summary, a survivorship care plan. Um, and then I, um, I work with a primary care provider who loves taking care of oncology so pediatric survivors. So if you can find, if you can, not you, the patients and the parents, but if you can find a doctor who can sort of make a partnership with your primary care provider, it makes a huge difference. Most adult doctors don't know what neuroblastoma is, period. They learned about it in medical school and never thought about it again. They wouldn't, if you walked in at age 30 and said, I had neuroblastoma when I was four, they would have no questions to ask. They exactly. wouldn't know like, so you can't, you can't hold that against them. What you can hold against them is if they're not willing to work in partnership with somebody who does know what neuroblastoma is. And then the last thing I'll say about that is often spouses are the ones that if for parents who are worried, that your child is out there and doesn't know anything when there's a future spouse on the scene, then they come back. They said, okay. so like, people walk into survivorship clinic and I say, what brings you here? And they say, she did. I want to know what he had. I want to know what it was. I want to know what it means, you know, that that developmental stage creates a caring about your own health as an adult because you have a valued relationship at that point. And it's somebody who's really going to take over a certain amount of that responsibility as a partner. Thanks. That's that's an excellent answer. Um, and I think it actually addresses a couple of the questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to pass to the first of the questions that's been uh, uh, voted up by a few people, um, probably for you, Dr. Sands. Is there a way of testing neuropsychology damage? Here in Europe, we only have educational psychology testing, which doesn't seem to be enough. A child can do very well on the ed uh, psych test, but we have all of the attention concentration issues on the list shown and what can be done to help. And there's a secondary question I got on the side as well that asks, it was kind of related to this, um, is there a way of knowing what the, what's the percentage of children who have 
problems. Um, does the research show anything about that? Yeah, so I am mindful of time. I am available to continue, but I just wanted to encourage families to use our emails uh, beyond this conference to stay in touch. Um, so briefly, yeah, neuropsychological assessment, I did, there is a slide that I, you know, um, talks about looking at, you know, memory for what they hear versus memory for what they see, um, their attention, their processing speed, the reading, spelling, math, etc. So anyway, um, and they're all age normed. So again, like I said, how we all have peaks and valleys. So you're looking for areas of normal, 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 and vocal areas of difficulty. If after I test somebody, I test them every year or two based on their age. If they're much younger, we'll test them every year. So you're going to get that to change over time. And we talk about recommendations. Um, I think what's possibly missing in the European assessment is uh, potentially is questionnaires that look at attention concentration and executive functioning that's filled out by the patient, by the parent, and preferably by the teacher. It's not like one is right, one's wrong. It's different perspectives, different levels of structure and relationships. And uh, so the attention concentration and executive functioning, when we test them, there's no distractions. We're telling them, do this, okay, do that, do this, you know, ready, go, okay, stop. And uh, that's not a real world example of my cell phone's going off, people wanna hang out. Um, I need, I have to study for three things and I'm hungry and I don't wanna work. Um, so it's really about an interview, but also questionnaires from parent, teacher and self for attention, executive functioning. And um, I, uh, I think those are the main parts. I, I wanna shy away from the last question of what percent because it's really 100% or nothing. It's either your child has these or they don't. So uh, there are common um, you know, uh, areas of difficulty, but uh, it's, I really am all more about understanding somebody's strengths and weaknesses and explaining it to them so they know rather than getting caught up in percentages of, of survivors who have this problem. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mostufi Moab, I see that you have to leave very soon. So I'm going to move to one of the questions that was specifically for you, which was how soon after treatment ends should growth hormone be started if needed, or does it just depend on the age of the individual child? So I think that that's actually an important question. In general, we like to make sure that there is a nice uh, sustained period of remission because in reality, most cancer recurrences happen within the first two years. So there's nothing magical about two years, but at least the earlier studies that introduced growth hormone in cancer survivors waited for like a period of two years before introducing growth hormone. So I think from my perspective, I usually like to see the patient. Typically they come to me and I'm already seeing them for many other things and maybe addressing the thyroid problem that uh, can manifest itself shortly even on treatment and you know watch the growth and I also like to see what is the neuroblastoma history there are some patients who have relapse on treatment more challenges difficult to get into remission that's a different kind of a patient versus someone who at least despite having high risk neuroblastoma has responded nicely to treatment has retained uh, achieved a remission and then maintains that remission so I think usually by two years uh, from you know two years in remission I actually feel fairly comfortable at that point uh, introducing growth hormone if there are no other concerning risk factors okay thank you and again thank you I know you have to leave now and thanks uh, thanks again I think you had your email available too so we're gonna, we'll make sure that uh, that gets communicated to people there's a few more questions here that, that uh, won't get answered that would be for you but we'll make sure they they, they get your email okay yeah um, if there's one question, I'm happy to answer and then I'll peel off. So if there's another question, I'm happy to address. Okay, there was, hold on. Um, is it normal for a child to grow quite normally in the time immediately after frontline treatment? And then the issues with growing would start at some stage a few weeks later, or would the issue with growth be seen immediately? So I think in general, it's sort of like a big picture. And yeah, during treatment, a lot of times growth actually start, slows down during treatment. I think that that's the reality of cancer therapy and then the other risk factors that we talked about, if nutrition is a challenge, et cetera, poor weight gain, weight loss. Um, but I think the bigger challenge with neuroblastoma is that even when you come off treatment and let's say the child is no longer needing even nutritional support like NG feeds and the parents perceive that 
he or she is eating well, et cetera, there's no really good period of one catch up growth and the growth rate continues to be suboptimal, even in patients who do not have growth hormone deficiency. So you can actually see a child evaluate and know that they're making plenty of growth hormone, but when you look at their growth rate um, and then you actually look to see where they were before their cancer treatment. And then now that's two or three years even um, after achieving remission, it's just really a slow um, suboptimal growth rate and it's far below where genetically that child was destined to be. That really is sort of like the hallmark of neuroblastoma growth. So it just never really um, gets better. And that kind of continues. And then what's really disappointing is during puberty, where you in normal individuals, or even in other uh, children after cancer therapy, when they have growth hormone deficiency, and as you're treating them with growth hormone, when they go through puberty, you actually see a nice, you know, growth response. And so you just don't see that important, that improvement in growth uh, in you know, high-risk neuroblastoma survivors, even if they're making plenty of growth hormone as they're even making their own puberty hormones, that growth rate is just not improving. So, and I think a lot of that really has to do with the end organ damage, meaning that the growth plates do not have their integrity to respond. So a lot of times I tell families that this issue here, unfortunately, is not a growth hormone problem, but it's more of a response. Um, and, you know, in the past, there definitely have been individuals who actually have tried treating with really high doses of growth hormone. For example, uh, when I was in training, there was an endocrinologist who used to do that and the treatment results were still uh, substantially inferior. So in my mind that actually, I, I do not um, you know, embrace that practice either in terms of over quote unquote overcoming resistance, giving higher doses of growth hormone, I don't necessarily. Um, but I think for me personally, I treat the children who have growth hormone deficiency, um, but sadly, even in those survivors who have bona fide growth hormone deficiency and go on growth hormone, their response rate is not as similar to, let's say, a brain tumor patient with a, you know, cisretinoic acid or a bone marrow transplant patient with a, you know, history of cisretinoic acid, which unfortunately is the unifying theme in terms of the growth plate response to treatment. Okay, thanks a lot. So I have um, my email, and if there's anyone that's my, uh, the endo late effects email, so this way, um, it won't get lost in my, you know, personal email and lots of deluge of this and that email. So this way we can just make sure if you have any questions or concerns, I'm happy to address those and we'll take care of it. That's great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, I look forward to staying in touch with anyone who has questions as well. And thank you for putting on this conference and hosting. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Sands. I, I do have, I think, one more question in the list that would be more for you if I can quickly, if I can uh, keep you on here just for another minute. Um, I want to find it because it was, uh, there's quite a few. Um, it was something about what to do to be more proactive about school. Ah, are there some things you suggest parents add to IEP plans in school to get them all the help they need, specifically around processing time and test taking? Yeah, so I'm happy to, you know, um, speak with families. It, it is driven by the data, by the test data, the neuropsych test scores. <clears throat> and um, uh, specifically, this parents asking about processing speed, test taking strategies. So, you know, I could talk for a long while, but briefly, um, it, it would be not only getting extra time, but a couple of things. One is to make sure the child knows how to use it, because sometimes, you know, boys, not exclusively, but it'll be, okay, I'm done or you know, other kids just yeah. to, won't want to utilize it and, and to, to teach them not only get the time, but teach them to circle uh, questions that they're not sure about to come back to later. Also, if they have to write an essay to think and uh, while everybody's writing and to start putting down, drawing down notes of what they want to say and then five minutes later to start writing it because they have the time to compose it. Um, also, things like a longer tests to be, to be broken up over multiple days as opposed to, okay, here's six hours, knock yourself out. No, it's like, okay, it's a three hour test today and then you'll come back tomorrow and you'll do the other three hours. People don't often know to ask for that. Other things are, and uh, generally for the audiences, <clears throat> copies of class notes from the teacher ahead of time and more for high school and college and graduate school, but teachers have PowerPoint slides. They can be compelled to present them to the person ahead of time so that uh, the student can print it, preview it, so they've had one pass at it, bring it into school and take notes on it so they're following and paying attention and it's the second time they're hearing it. Then they can raise their hand and say, hey, I still don't understand this, can you explain it to me? And then for the teachers who don't have notes, 
uh, you would have a student who gets credit for taking notes for uh, kids in class. So that would be afterwards. So the student would have to pay attention and take notes, but uh, could get copies later. Um, so those are the main things. The test taking strategy, are there learning specialists who not, there are those who are content who can help with English and history and you know, physics and calculus, but there's also executive functioning coaches uh, who can work with kids on how to manage your time. Okay, you have a, t a spelling test on Thursday and a math test on Friday. What's your plan? How are you going to do this? Uh, also, um, reviewing errors, reviewing mistakes afterwards is huge. Kids don't want to raise their hand six times in school to say, explain that, explain that. Yeah. But it's one-on-one, -on -one, hey, and then what proportion of, oh, I knew that. Uh, why, why, how did, no, it's so silly. Why did I make that mistake? So that's clearly cueing them that they have to pay better attention, double check their work versus, oh, I didn't understand it then, I still don't get it, can you explain it to me? Okay, now I get it. So reviewing your errors I think is important. Again, being encouraged not to rush through your tests, but to slow down, go back to your seat, double check your work. Sometimes people have in there that they can have the test directions read to them. Some people add that they can ask clarifying questions of the teacher. Uh, some teachers are asked to go and uh, inquire, make sure the child understands what's going on, to check in on them. So those are the high points, the, the highlights. But I'm um, happy to talk more over email, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to the parents who are in attendance. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that pretty much uh, makes us out of time. Um, I want to thank again all of the panelists for the great presentations, and thank you to everyone who's watching and also for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, but they've been noted and we're going to try to see what we can do to get uh, answers to you. And um, uh, the, you have the if you don't have the emails, we'll get those emails. Also, you can ask uh, each presenter directly. They, they've put their email on the presentation. Um, we've reached the end of the session today, but please join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. GMT for the SIOP and ITCC relapse strategy trials strategy and trials. And remember, if you've missed a session, you can still watch it on the on-demand page on the event website. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.